Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocate on PLUS TV Africa. Five panelists, five topical issues, all completely unique with a singular purpose, to advocate for a better society. On today's edition, David is asking, are you looking up or down? And no, it's not a trick question. Libras' advocacy may look like a game of rhymes, as some might even say, mago mago, fit be like play play, but na serious matabidato. Just wait and see. Aisha Yusufu, the very same Bring Back Our Girls advocate, is also asking a question that reads like a riddle. Are we raising citizens or slaves? Hmm, let's pause and think about that one. And if you think you're in for some soul searching, then wait till Emeka finishes with you. He's also asking, what is a government good for? Hmm. Today, na jam season. Lucky for you, we have some inspiration to kick off the session. I'm talking achieving greatness, not in spite, but because of us. The clock is ticking. Let's get started. Destiny may well be a correlation of variables. The right person at the right time in the right place. Have you come across the video of 11-year-old Anthony Meso Mamadu dancing ballet in the rain somewhere in Lagos? If not, look it up. You won't be disappointed. I'm a believer in greatness against the odds. The spirit of resilience, fueled by self-belief and a belief in a just God. Indeed, the annals are replete with chronicles of people who rose to greatness against the odds. All they started off with was a talent here, a vision there. Their beginnings were notably insignificant, but today they're people of note. Today we speak of Cosmos Madika, Steve Jobs, Abraham Lincoln, Kelechi Amadi, and tomorrow, Meso Mamadu. It is a tale that is as old as time, but which never ages. We need to hear it now more than ever. Someone recently told me in the midst of the pandemic as a consultant physician, training younger doctors, he would often remind them that the human spirit is resilient indeed. People will survive one way or the other. They'll find a way, he would say. So his caution would always be, don't let it be said that they survived in spite of us. Nigeria's story seems to be punctuated by the refrain, they survived in spite of us. They achieved greatness in spite of us. Sad, but true. God and the universe are constituted to ensure that the scales are justly balanced, no matter the evil weighted against it. And this is why we'll continue to come across stories of greatness sprouting amidst the soil of corruption. It speaks to the indomitable spirit of divinity in us and around us. 11-year-old Mesoma is the perfect epitome of this. In pants and a vest, he dances bare feet. He dances gloriously in the rain, somewhere in Lagos. Yet, he dances on a global stage, elevated by social media. Neglected by his country, he stuns the world. I want to encourage us with my advocacy that just as the sun will surely come out after the storm, so greatness awaits us in spite of the injustice that seems to be the signature of our times and our society. As it is written, a man's gifts will make room for him and bring him before great men. So stay faithful to your gifts, especially when social systems are unfaithful to you. Hone your talents diligently in readiness for the day of greatness, as surely as if you had an appointment with destiny. As for the rest of us who will have the opportunity to witness and encourage another's journey, let it not be said that they achieved greatness in spite of us, but because of us. I hear you, Aisha. You said hmm. you want to you want to throw in your hat. Oh my goodness! <laughs> uh, the words were deep. Okay. 
Please go ahead. We're listening. Oh, oh, oh okay. So those words were just uh, for me. Uh, it, it just said everything. Let it not be said that uh, they achieve greatness in spite of us, but because of us, in spite of us bringing them down, in spite of uh, in spite of the fact that we are not doing what we need to do uh, as citizens of this nation. We are not. We've not given our children the environment that they need to be able to excel on, on, on a global forum. They are excelling, but that shouldn't be the case. That, 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 that is, for me, is the saddest part of it all. It should be a situation whereby we are encouraging them. They have everything that they need to be able to, 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 uh, to, to thrive on the global stage, to be able to be there and be the amazing human beings that they can be and their talent will flourish. That's what we are supposed to do. And unfortunately, uh, as citizens, as parents, we have failed to do that. And it is very important for everyone of us to begin to ensure that in spite not just in spite of what we're doing, we go beyond that and begin to uh, ensure that because of what we are doing, we are giving uh, citizens of our nation more enabling environment for them to excel and take their rightful place in the world, which is right at the top. I like the advocacy, and I think that um, it's just kind of like um, tells the story of Nigeria in many ways, where this is a country that wasn't designed for success. Um, it was almost designed to benefit other people other than the ci its citizens. Uh, but in spite of Who does of it what, benefit? <laughs> oh, it benefits the people who set it up. The, okay. the you know, the, okay. the, 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 the there's a political system founders. that it was set up. Um, it's a, it's, we've had this discussion yes, on the show yes, before. Yes, yes, I remember now. But I think it's, it, it's, it bears repeating and based on your advocacy that in spite of the system, um, that you find occasional flashes of brilliance and talent. And, and the beautiful thing about talent is that um, it perseveres, I think, and it will come out. But, I, but herein lies the problem. We should design the system, our country, in such a way that it enables talent to, to prosper, yeah. to come out, not in spite of, you know. So every other thing is designed to, to stunt your talent, or to, to deny you the benefit of you even, you know, exercising your talent. Yeah. Whether it be creative talent, you talk about uh, people in the, in the creative industry, mm -hmm. books or, mm -hmm. or writers or filmmakers, high level of piracy, you know, and so on and so forth. So I think that, you know, um, this is really, it, it's more for calling each and every one of us to to just continue to do what you do, what you love to do, yeah. and the passion that you have. And, and, you know, for me, I believe that the more passionate you are, with a little bit of training, uh, um, you'll be able to make a success of yourself yeah. in spite of the system. The it might not be as big and as, you know, as, as stunning as all the people in other systems, in other countries. But I think that, um, you know, we should not, you know, don't lose give up hope. On your it just keeps striving. Yeah. 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 What I would just have to add to that is that on the on the personal level, I completely agree with what he said that the system is the most important thing because obviously without the system, regardless of any personal achievements, it's still going to be futile in the end. But on a personal level, those of us who who have who have certain gifts, who have certain talents, owe it. Yeah. I think not just to ourselves, but also owe it to the world. Mm -hmm. to do what we can to put those things out. I think um, if, you're, if you are in urban Nigeria, you have access to the internet, you have these basic facilities of life that most of, most of us have access to nowadays, the, you still, obviously, you are still disadvantaged in many ways by virtue of being in Nigeria, but the number of excuses is highly reduced. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because in a way, the... The internet and technology has kind of leveled the playing field to an extent, yeah. not just within Nigeria, but globally as well. Yeah. And that has created new opportunities. That has created an entire new economy that is out of the control of those who set up Nigeria. So which gives you an opportunity to elevate yourself, if not necessarily in economic terms, certainly in intellectual terms. So I don't mean to sound like you know, an old, you know, old man lecturing people on this show, but from the point of view of someone who uh, interacts with people a lot on, on social media as I do, I think my, my big takeaway will be that those of us who, who have access to the internet, should the internet is a huge it. human resource. Yeah. We yeah. should use it in ways that are productive. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. 
uh, you see um, your advocacy would um, at first instance encourage you know um, our rulers I, I won't call them leaders to continue what they are doing say look well they will survive you know in spite of what you do what, whatever you like they will survive but on the flip side over time it will um, you know bring them to reality sort of to realize that look oh, you know, these people survived without us, so what's the use? Mm. So I think I better even do the right thing. Mm. Because now their story will be told without me being part of the success story. And then um, I also agree completely with David that um, the internet is a big stage, it's a big tool. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever you're doing, uh, I see, and I see a lot of people using it now. You see everybody now, you know, talk on record videos and, and, and share. Mm. And it goes far. You never can tell how the extent that it will go. Look at that young boy singing, um, you know, Christian hymns. Yes, I and you see how, how, you know, that video had gone. And now, all of a sudden, the government who ought to be responsible <laughs> to him, and now waking up to be responsible. Yeah. And, and so I would encourage people to don't sit down there and say, I do not have anybody to help me. Mm. Just keep doing it yeah. and put it out there on the internet. Yeah. And someday, somebody somewhere might just we'll see it. Because even and, the person who set and, up... And, and, sorry, sorry quickly. Mm. And then this, even this advocate that we do, you find out that your, 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 your uh, um, what do you call it, um, your intro or your take or your, your opening, um, your monologue, you can't tell the extent that it Where goes. Go, also, yeah. speak to people. Yeah. And, and so consistently, uh, money might not come at the beginning, but just have that passion and share it. And, you know, with time, you'll find out that the world, you know, will create a path to you. Yeah, yeah. True. I mean, because the person who set up the ballet school, he did it for free. There was no space. Um, I forget his name. I think it's called Leap Dance. And he, does, he just chose to do yeah. it for children in Lagos, downtrodden. And this boy just caught everyone's attention. Anyway. Just as I seek to inspire, David seeks to challenge. He has a question for us after the break. Our perspective can be significantly affected by our orientation. What say you? My advocacy today is titled, Are You Looking Up or Down? In 1988, when the impending fall of the Soviet Union was getting closer by the day, a Russian social scientist by the name of Georgi Abatov made the following cryptic comment to an American acquaintance. He said, we are going to do a terrible thing to you. We are going to deprive you of an enemy. Now, when the Soviet Union fell in 1989, America now had a new problem on its hands. Now that the big fight against the enemy had been won, what next? If for half a century you have defined your foreign and national policy purely in terms of opposition to an enemy, what do you do with yourself when said enemy ceases to exist? How are you then supposed to define yourself when the fight against the enemy is all that you have ever known? Identifying oneself in terms of a fight against an enemy is something we are all too familiar with in this part of the world. From our anti-colonial movements, which said, away with the white man, to our popular uprisings against dictators, where we said, this person must go, to the way we run our political campaigns like literal warfare, down to the way we perceive each other and even exist within our family units, there's always an element of us versus them. Now, my friend Eugene Uzo regularly makes the point that historically and currently, selection of leaders in African societies is rarely based just on who will deliver results for those that they lead, but rather more about who can apparently fight an external enemy and inflict the maximum pain on them. While the skill set needed to oppose or fight an enemy certainly has its uses, and those who have this skill set have a place in society, typically in the military and in the national security space, Africa's history over the past half century shows us that using these people as leaders in lieu of actual nation builders invariably results in economic collapse, deadly conflicts, and avoidable human misery. Those who fought the power via activism or via warfare and later became heads of state, such as Robert Mugabe, Idi Amin, Julius Nyerere, Kwame Nkrumah, Charles Taylor, and many others, almost without exception, became totalitarian dictators who ran their economies into the ground or started off deadly conflicts. The sole exception that proves this rule is a certain Nelson Rolihlahla Mandela. This is the classic problem of positive definition versus negative definition that is explained by the work of psychiatrist 
Elizabeth Kubler Ross. According to her, all human emotion boils down to one of just two things, fear or love. This means that the self-identity that is contingent to an external enemy is built on fear and can only reproduce negative results. A positive self-identity centers on what an individual or group of people actually needs. Hence, it is built on love. The positive identity seeks to serve the people and add value to their lives as against simply fight an external enemy. It asks, what do we want and how do we get it? Not simply, who don't we like and how can we cause them damage? The negative identity is insular and looks for scapegoats. The positive one is open to discover and explore solutions. The negative identity looks down for mediocre excuses. The positive one looks up for possibilities. So wherever you are on the continent and indeed in the world, please take an honest look at yourself today and answer the question, am I looking up or down? Yeah, and I want to take it, be, go on from there because um, you know, initially when I was reading this, I'm like I could identify with the things you were saying. Um, and just now as you were talking, I'm thinking, Nelson Mandela, part of why you have so much regard for him is that he started off on that us versus them when yes. he was you know, bombing you know, the white South Africans. But at some point, he was able to transition and mature out of that because I just see it as a very primitive level of reasoning where you're doing us versus them. You know? And so you, that, this is why he was like a magnet for a lot of people. A lot of people could rally behind him no matter where they are in the world because he went beyond his own limited self-interest to now looking at almost like a father figure, which is what we thought our president would represent when he came in, you know, for nobody and everybody, but uh, lo and behold, here we are, you know. So, but I want to go beyond that and say, I feel, you know, there was a time Libras did an advocacy on the dangers of a single story, that the onus is now on the media houses, because the reason people can continue to peddle this kind of insular mindset and, and put it out there as if it's the, the, the standard is because we don't have enough representation of alternative stories. So the media really have a, a, a job on their hands to keep representing, doing documentaries that show us, even when you say this is the life of this person, go into their life so we can identify with them as a human being. We can find that human connection mm -hmm. and we don't have the excuse of saying that they're the other and we are, you know, and then we don't fall into the hands of politicians who play us and use divisive politics to get their, you know, to get their way. Can I say that, um the example of Mandela and the way you, the analysis you put forth, um, suggests to me that um, you can be both, or people change based yeah. on the circumstances. Um, and I think that um, even in leaders who have transitioned, the transition based on their own recognition of what you're saying. When was when when is it okay to have this adversarial? Uh, combative disposition in terms of identifying that this person is an enemy uh, or this situation is, is, is an enemy and we need to get rid of it or at least we need to fight it. But, you know, um, and then transition afterwards to say, look, we've gotten rid of the enemy or we have turned the enemy into um, an ally. Okay. And therefore we now need to work together. Yeah. I think it's a recognition, I, and it goes back to the leadership skills of the individual or, or the, the nation states. I think we've been pretty unfortunate in this climb, um, you know, to have people who, who sort of are stuck in, in that adversarial mindset yeah. Yeah. where they only recognize it's us versus them, mm -hmm. it's this tribe or this group of people and you know, I don't see, occasionally you might pick out individuals of- You want you know, to favor. <laughs> you want to favor, but that's not leadership. Yeah. But I, I, I believe that you know, um, by and large, um, it goes back to, there's no training that you go through for this. It, it, it is something that you, even in Turkey, Kamal Ataturk transitioned. Um, you know, I mean, he may not be recognized as the best of leaders, but he did good for his own people. <laughs> I mean, the Albanians and the, the Armenians strongly disagree, uh, with, you. Who, strongly disagree <laughs> with me, but, but um, or the Turks rather, but, but, but that is, you know, it's defining what you want as a person, what you want for your country or for your people, um, and then going for it. I think that the human nature, the way it is, you can, people can transition. Can learn. Yeah, can Aisha, learn. Aisha, do you agree? Yeah, people can learn and people can change and people can do better. And so for me, you know, just a statement you made earlier on when we were talking about 
that was what was expected of the president when he was coming in. And of course, when he said uh, he belongs to nobody and uh, anybody or everyone, you know, that particular statement, it got people uh, focusing on that. And you see, when people talk about, you know, oh, you know, his antecedent, he couldn't have changed. I mean, you're like, over how many period of uh, years? And I always say to citizens, uh, look, for those who feel uh, sometimes they are being told, oh, you know, you voted uh, him in 2015. You shouldn't have gone this way. They feel sad. I said, no, the onus wasn't, isn't on you to give Nigeria's good governance. It's on the person who was voted in. And I think what is most important here is that it's always about us, the individual. It's about people. Are you thinking in terms of uh, what is it that can do to make a difference? For me, it's always, I always say, it's always about your action, not the result. Forget about what the result is. You should ask yourself, what are you doing? So it's not really about that other person. Are you are you an active citizen? Are you doing what you're supposed to do right now? Are you making the demands? Because governance, of course, is made up of demand and supply. Uh, for example, if you're talking in terms of governance and the citizens are supposed to demand why those we voted for supply, even when they are not supplying the right thing, we don't. You, it's not for us to see them as the enemies or the ones we're fighting. Okay. We have to That's consider it as <laughs> are we saying, are we doing the right thing that we should do as citizens in spite of what is happening? Sorry, Aisha, and I have to confess, I've, I've seen government as the enemy at times, actually. That we'll be back to <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling. I'm struggling to transition because I, at times I've seen government as the enemy. No, but really, um, <laughs> um, for me, there is no one. There is no way you can consistently look up or consistently look down. You have to look down to be able to look up. Okay, you can an look interesting up. philosophy. Yeah, you you have to look down to be able to look up. Okay. Here we are in your advocacy. We talked about. Um, in spite of being successful, in spite of them. Yes. You don't fold your hands and say, "Oh." they are doing it wrongly. And, and so, if I have the opportunity to push them out, and so yes. I should just leave it because I don't want to look down. Yes, okay. You have that to look down. down. Yeah. You have to look down, push them out. As in challenge the system. And then when you get there, that was what Nelson Mandela did. Okay. He challenged the system, he got punished for it, but when he, he got the opportunity, he, he said, he no, <laughs> we have to do it, because people expected him now to see them as the enemy. No, these people punished us. When it's our turn, punish, punish them, them also. He said, no. This is the time for peace. We have to. You don't have to. The same thing that you criticize, you don't have to repeat it. Yeah. That's, this is the time now to look up. Yeah. Because we had looked down ah, okay. and I'm, we I'm, have I'm, removed I'm the enemy. Mm -hmm. And so the time, the enemy is gone. The time to look up so that posterity also will, you know, write our name in gold in the sand of time to mm -hmm. say, when we came, we did it differently. Yeah. You know, but that's where a lot of leaders miss it. Yeah. You come, Buhari also missed it from that point. Mm. He came, everybody supported him. Yes, we want these people out. We are all looking down. Gulag Jonathan was go. Mm. Buhari came on board. And we expected him to say, now Bring I am the president together. of everybody, both those that voted for me and those that didn't vote for me. Mm. We need to all look Come up together. together. Yes. Carry everybody and look up. But what did he do? Continue. He remembered that some people didn't vote for yes. him. And he continually looked down. And so everybody that is with him is now looking down today. And that's why we are back to where we were. Okay, that's interesting. So that's, that's my conclusion on this. And well, David presents us with a question. After the break, get ready for my rhyme, as Ekene puts it, it's title for season of corruption. According to Birago Diop, a Senegalese poet, if we tell gently, gently, all that we shall one day have to tell, we will hear our voices with our laughter. You probably have heard of four seasons of loneliness, as is a four season of corruption. Magu FC and Malami FC have locked horns in a fierce battle of revelation of who is more corrupt. Aquabio strikers and Nunia slappers are there thrilling their fans to a marketplace nakedness of Cambridge slap, Oxford husband. Yet, we the spectators have been distracted from the weighty matters of monies meant for the development of Niger Delta, which have found their way into private pockets. How about the allegations of corrupt enrichment and financial impropriety levied against Abubakar Malemi the Attorney General of the Federation. Are they also just going to end up in the realm of social media? Remember, ICPC recovers and manages asset too. When are we going to look into their books? And the only answer I get from all of this is that if you malemi me, I will magu you. 
If you say I help myself to recover loot, I will say you awarded oil contract to someone standing trial for air theft. If you sack me for insubordination, I will say you bought an expensive house for your son and threw a lavish wedding party for him. But in Port Harcourt babes, or Port Harcourt boys, Don Cramanti should, should be collecting royalty for use of his rhyme. If you anang me, I will guni you. If you akpabio me, I will nunia you. If you try to entangle me, I will slap you. And if you say I stole, I will say you married for husband. And if you say I don't have NYC certificate, I will tell how your girlfriends are the ones supplying diesel to NDDC. If you say I was sacked for insubordination, I will report all that you stole. Well, looking at the two people involved here, they look good together as I see love in their eyes. So what corruption in NDDC has brought together, let no probe put asunder. I hear land they're ever looking for her to arrest now. Yet, this is supposed to be the interim management committee that is to forensically audit the NDDC according to the uncommon transformator who receive uncommon slap from a common MD who is insubordinate. Is President Buari aware of all of these happenings? He's never aware. Anyway, let's wait until Attorney General of the Federation, Malemi, maybe write him another memo. Or is the government just a sheer joke or just a, a usual script from old drama? How many of us remember Honorable Hembe and uh, Maru Maote? Like my bon Foli, Fol, uh, Yori Folare would say, the season of absurdity no be today. I would therefore advocate that as government is auditing the FCC, the terms of reference of Justice Ayo Salami's panel should also be expanded to cover ICPC as an anti-graft agency responsible for recovering public funds too. They should sh also show us their books to ensure that recovered loots are not relooted. And as Magu is suspended, the Attorney General of the Federation should also be asked to step aside for thorough investigation into the activities of his office against those weighty allegations of corruption and financial impropriety. Lastly, Akpabio and his interim management committee should also be suspended, a board properly con constituted, and an independent forensic auditor appointed to clinically audit the commission and whoever found culpable shown the way to jail. That way, the president would have shown that there is indeed a new vigor in the fight against corruption. But well, I have my doubts. I bet clear rules for Jaga Jaga. As you hear the smell. Not be Nigeria with it. So all this fine, beautiful thing where you say we could still clear road. <laughs> because I told you I have my doubts. Mm -hmm. um, you know, look, I've had my experience in, in, in government, I've been burned. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that, you know, there is, there is um, the whole system, the whole system um, from the top, there needs to be, uh, how should I put it? Restructuring. Uh, restructuring. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's, it's mind boggling. You know, when I was watching TV and listening to accusations and counter accusations of all kinds of figures being peddled around. But I think the whole thing for me is really the fact that um, there needs to be, as to borrow um, Liberos, um, uh, there needs to be a lot more vigor and transparency into even how the agencies that are responsible for transparency and fighting corruption, how they, how they operate. And it goes back to, I think, a fundamental thing is not respecting the rule of law. Okay. Because when people, and I mean, and this is the funny thing where um, when people were saying that, look, even Magu himself, the way he was detained, did not follow due process. Okay. And, 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 and the way that they're acting, the, the, even the, the terms of reference are not known. If the way we are fighting this corruption is not transparent, then that's, that's in itself is corruption. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Look at how the FBI conducted raids. Um, they took their time, they were diligent, and when they did, when you read the, the charge sheet, the FBI, you will see the... Mecca, the... do you know why? Quick, quickly, because there is another body that will review the step taken in those okay. raids. Okay, interesting. There is always, you know, a monitoring and enforcement body. So you're accountable to someone you're else. You're accountable to someone else. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will take it from the point of view yeah. of systems again, because, you know, I look at it and I'm thinking, well, I agree. First of all, I agree with his recommendations that, you know, the ICPC too, let's, let's wait for them to be scrutinized because it won't come full circle until all the relevant bodies are scrutinized. But I was looking at the systems and I was saying to myself, 
like he was saying, the logic, you know, if we put in the right systems, even the wrong people will be sifted out. Yes. But I was listening to someone recently who works in the private sector, and if you see how carefully they're minting their system so that when they go to get contractors, you will, if you don't get the, make the cut, you're the wrong person. So my, then that took me back to thinking, the reason we have this problem is that we're trying to get out the wrong people, and it's more costly getting out the wrong people. It's easier to get the, when you get the right people who will then do the right things. Mm -hmm. And then I say to myself, why is it that the wrong people are systematically the ones at the heads of these organizations? Then I thought, and I may be wrong, so correct me. It has to do with our costly election process. You know, so if you go into, if you, if you have thugs and people who have the money in abundance, not many people are dangote, and they fund you, they want their payback. And the way of paying them back is to give them all these appointments. So you get a lot of people who are there, not because of merit or because they're the right people, the, th the technocrats we're waiting for, but because they're owed something. They've paid for your election. They want their payback. And so you have a lot of these you know, godfathers you know, putting in their people, no. I'm wrong. Okay, so yeah. if we make, so if, if, I, if I was right, I'll say, if we get the election process, make it less um, uh, money oriented, mm -hmm. then when you come in, you don't have the baggage of having to pay people back and you're shackled to them and you're almost like a stooge and you know, the wife of president is saying, you know, the, the people around him are not even the people they started off with. That's my thinking, I may be wrong. And Neka was appointed, not because he was a politician. Uh, occasionally. There are people, but if you set out to appoint technocrats, you will get them. Mm. But sometimes some people don't just set out so because they don't want those who are brighter than them. Yeah. But so how do the, the wrong people for... get in there? I'm still also Yeah, that's why I said yeah. to some extent yeah. you're right. Uh, Aisha? Um, uh, okay, uh, yeah, to, to, to some extent, of course, you're right in the sense that in Nigeria generally, uh, we reward bad behavior and we punish people for doing the right thing. Yeah. And so it's, it's a culture that has, you know, systematically, it's everywhere. You have to ah, bear, is this not Nigeria? You too, you sabi do what is it? Behave the Nigeria. So we sort of like accepted that and, and, and it's really uh, affecting us. But let me take it from where uh, uh, my brother ended, where he talked about the fact that uh, make, make we clear road for Jaga Jaga, they are this man. The thing we say, we don't clear road, so they're not there for you. <laughs> that we always clear this road. So time don't reach where we go sit down for that road. Maybe we, we will stay there, turn down for there. And I think. The biggest way structurally that needs to be done is that you. of citizens. Those people you. are having a ball. They're having the fun of their life. They're enjoying themselves. They do all of this drama every time. We've seen it over and over again. It's not a fight against corruption or for corruption or whatever. It's just boys fighting their big boys fighting their big fight. Yes. And then we, we are spectators. We are there. Our yes. mumu don't suppose do. That is who you and do. We don't be mumu. It's time for us to get our acts together. And I think that restructuring has to come from the angle of the citizens understanding the effect of governance on their lives. The biggest problem we have in Nigeria is the fact that people can go to other people and have their needs, needs met. Yeah. So what's the essence of making demands on government when you can go to, to your sense. neighbor? If you look at this ending this meeting and look at the fact that see the number of students that are suffering abroad, that have been crying out for over two years, that are being treated inhumanely because of the fact that their state, their government refused to pay their fees. And then you, you see the whole of this corruption thing going on. You, you almost want to puke. But we have a citizens who, who are unconcerned about what is going on. They just want to see. And you know the thing that we're very good at, we abdicate our responsibilities to God. We always fight for God and leave our fight to God. Or you so fight the binary war of us against from, them. Yeah, become active citizens and make the man. We don't do that. I don't 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 know. Completely <laughs> with what Aisha said. The only thing I would add to what she said is that in addition to the citizens themselves becoming aware of their place in Nigeria and their place in the world, from an economic point of view, which is where I tend to specialize in, I think, first of all, the citizens and generally the structure of the country itself needs to open up in a way that government becomes, presently the government is the wealthiest entity in Nigeria. Yeah. Which is wrong. It yeah. shouldn't mm -hmm. be. Yeah. So yeah, if you want to become extremely wealthy in Nigeria, Just join you government. go into government. Government is the biggest also, if you want sponsor to be, government. Yeah, if mm. you want to become extremely wealthy in the US or in Brazil, you're going to private enterprise. Yes. You have begun to hear our thoughts. Now it's time to listen to yours. And um, spiritual solution to Nigeria's quandary. That's uh, Seidu's advocacy. Fatum 2K10 has a lot to say. The late great Yoruba philosopher, Madam Sophie Oluwole, brought a lot of clarity and objective information in regards to everything surrounding the Yoruba philosophy. The Orisha that have been wrongly and falsely claimed to be worshipped by the Yoruba people Iron gods, but powerful leaders that were distant from the people because of their contribution and development they brought. 
Objectively speaking, Olodumare is the one true power and supreme intelligence worshipped and acknowledged by the Yoruba people. Then you have his agents or messengers known as the Orishas, Oshun, and the rest of the Yoruba Orishas weren't supposed to be worshipped like the creator Olodumare, but rather acknowledged and greatly respected for what they did. Before the British invaded our land and introduced Christianity in the 19th century, where our people, where our people not spiritual, were we not sophisticated and intelligent people? Did we not have our own system in place? Why is it that once Christianity was introduced and adopted, our spiritual system and philosophy was considered evil? Hmm, Phantom, it's like you took time to look into the matter. Thanks for enlightening us, and um, I'm in perfect simulacrum with you also. On Aluta Continua, Dele Dosumu says, Magu Saga is a distraction. Nigeria won't benefit from whatever the outcome is. We need to focus on how we can wake Nigeria up to demand equity and justice system. What we have on ground right now is a shambo, an insult to the Nigerians' intelligence. We need to sensitize the consciousness of every Nigeria. Until then, we have a long way to go. Thanks, Dele. Many would agree with you, and this is why we keep advocating for a better society. Advocate with us on our social media platform on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG, and on Twitter and Instagram, at Plus TV Africa, hashtag the Advocate NG. And to catch up with previous broadcasts, simply go to plustvafrica.com for slide the advocate. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Up next, fresh and not frustrated, it's Aisha Yusufu with another question. My sister, big up, continue. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. You're watching The Advocate on Plus TV, and yes, Liboros and Ekene are right. I have a question for you. Are we bringing up citizens or slaves? Many have said the resilience of Nigerians and our capacity to accept anything meted out to us by our leaders is that of this world. It is even said that if you push Nigerians to the world, instead of fighting back, they will simply dig a hole in the wall and make the most of the situation with a smiling face, of course. Our docility as a people has been much talked about, and those who lead us know very well about this docility and have used it to their advantage. What kind of people are we? And why are we ready to smile, in, even in the face of things that have made citizens of many other countries pour out on the street in vexation? Many have put it down to our disunity. Is that really the case, or is there much more to it? It's our docility as a result of our upbringing. Our parents bringing up children that are taught that having a voice and making demands are a necessary part of life. How many parents allow their children to have a say in what goes on in the house? How many allow their children to question their authority and make demands on them? Isn't the child who never says anything and does all he or she is told seen as the ideal child, while the one who questions is accepted and makes the man seen as a stubborn child and punished? Hmm. Having children be punished just for speaking up and demanding to be heard. How many times did we, did we hear the saying that elders are always right? And that even when elders are speaking, a child should not speak. It is seen as a sacrilege for a child to even contradict an adult, even when the adult is so obviously wrong. The schools aren't different. The same demand is made on the child to obey given authority without any complaint nor demands made by the, by the child. 
Being punished for being a stubborn child has led to adults that have simply replaced the parent and adults in their life with those they voted to serve them. And it is time we parents really begin to look at ourselves and ask ourselves whether we are bringing up citizens who understand the, their role in society and make demands, or we are bringing up slaves who would accept anything meted out to them. Because being good is never about speaking up or having a voice. This is a question we really need to ask ourselves. Now the bond is strong. We are we were we were wrapped. That's why we're we're listening, letting it marinate. Please, David. Spot on, spot on. I don't think it's possible to agree any more with Aisha than I already do. Speaking as someone who was mm. the ultimate stubborn child, I know exactly what that means, you know, because I also grew up in proximity with those who were ideal children. And in our, in our adulthood, it's very easy to see who has turned out into what. So the stubborn child has turned into the person who has no problem asking questions. OK, you were the stubborn child? Very much so. Oh, really? I have no problem asking questions of people who don't want to be asked questions. OK. While those who grew up around me, who, knew, who learned how to shrink themselves in the presence of authority, are still that way. OK. But did your parents encourage that, or you're just the way you were? Oh, well, my parents absolutely did not encourage that. Okay. So I, <laughs> innate. I, I didn't have a fun time growing up. Okay. But in many ways, that, that thick skin is kind of what makes me the person that I am now. So obviously, this isn't to say that you know, being a, being a strong-headed, you know, strong aggressive person necessarily is a good thing on its own, in itself. Mm -hmm. It has its usefulness if it's challenged, if it's channeled the right way. And mm. that's why I agree with what, with what Aisha said. In this part of the world, we have this very damaging idea that children are, children are items. For so, display. Yeah, so a child is basically just an extension of the parents. Mm. As against a fully formed human being in their that own right. That can think independently. So, so we, we fail to understand that when a child is six, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, we, you know, we don't really see them as anything. Their, their opinions, you know, they don't really know that much. But we fail to understand that what they are picking up from their environment at that time, it's very rare for them to lose it. The way we knew people when they were 12, 13 years old, more often than not, it's still the same way they are now. People don't really change that dramatically. So if at that early age, you don't teach children that it's OK to contradict someone who's in authority, it's OK to look at someone who's older than you and ask why. It's OK that when someone tells you, sit down, you ask the person why. You know, we, we don't do that in this part of the world. We, we say, oh, trust and obey. The person is older than you, the person is in a position yeah. of authority, that's yeah. it. I, 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 can, um, I, I completely agree with um, Aisha. That's why I said. Um, um, get more so okay, no, get, get. Uh, <laughs> the truth that you're speaking and, uh, and and so I practically you know I was a rebel yes um, okay uh, yes. all the rebels on this panel yes I, I was I was a rebel um, <laughs> okay. and at some point I had to knee down all through but I'm happy um, having grown up with my uncle I am happy that I went through the process I went through um, about now times have changed you know having gone through that process I have a different relationship with my children we bond, we, we relate like guys. Mm. Uh, and then, uh, but it's a cultural thing. Yeah. It's this cultural hangover of the king can do no wrong. And then also we carry it over to political life. I remember in a class in the um, University of Benin, I, I wasn't in uni, but I was in Ekpum, and I went to attend a, a, a lecture with my friend, and then I contradicted the lecturer. Because I had read the nine before. I read that topic the nine before. And then when she was talking and then she gave his stance, he cited the case and I said, no, I have a contrary opinion. I read Bernard and Huggins and then he said it different to Kolawole and Abato. And she said, who are you to have a contrary opinion to have my opinion? For I us to bring up leaders, you have to actually teach them to be yeah. kings. I think that um, Aisha's advocacy is spot on about 
you know, and, and you hear that a little bit in my own advocacy because kind of, there's a link between that. In fact, all of today's. Yeah, but, we're but, flowing. Yeah, we're, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of flow. <laughs> but I think um, to, to take on from what, to sort of wrap it from what uh, Liberos was saying is there's a necessity, and I think we need to agree that we need, in building a new society, in building a new system, we need to realize that we as parents, we have a, a responsibility to, to teach our children that to we have are in a voice. A, to have a voice. The question. Um, you know, um, and, and that voice may not necessarily be the kind of David's voice that is, is you know, was, as a child was always the one breaking rules and boundaries. Mm -hmm. But we have a necessity, we have a responsibility rather to teach them that you, you, you have, you're part of the society and you should ask questions. And the way we teach, even in secondary school, even the system of learning should follow that, that line. Where, because if you, if you went to school in a different climate, students and pupils are allowed to think, and to th not just to cram, but yeah. to think and yeah. to reflect and to, and to fashion things. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, 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 that, that, that's I mean, why I think I will, I will concur with everybody. Aisha, thank you for bringing it home, literally. I can just, I can just come in um, for, for a little bit. Okay. You know, this relates to what is happening today in our society. A lot of people are still being punished. Like what he said, you know, speaking up in, in school and contra in the class and contradicting his lecturer. And look, the way she reacted is the way people are still reacting. And then, you know, you, you asked the question earlier on why are the wrong set of people getting into position? They are being rewarded for looking the other way when looks are going on for, for, for supporting the wrong thing. Those who speak out, who stand against the wrong thing that is being done, you find that they are punished, they are pushed out of the way. I have kids. My youngest child is 18. She's going to be 19 uh, in, in December. And what I said to my children always, right from when they were kids, that look, I'm not always right. And they don't have to obey me if they are not uh, sure and they are not, uh, they are not, they don't accept what I'm talking about. The only thing I said to them is the only thing you obey is God. For me as a parent, I don't owe you. We, we, we will have a discussion. And I find a lot of people, a lot of parents are not able to do this. Let me just give you a, an example before I round up. Normally, if I see a child, before I hug the child, I always ask the child, please, can I hug you? And sometimes the kids say no, and I'm fine with it. And you see their parents trying to force them. And I always say to the parents, no, you can't force them. You must allow them to have their own safe space, yeah. where if they don't feel like hugging me, it's is absolutely right, and they have a right to say, look, Aisha, I don't want to hug you, and it's perfectly okay. Yeah. Uh, until we begin to do that, we continue to have this to sit down and accept anything being done by the leaders that we have put in. Yeah, and I think, um, because I feel, just very quickly, because I think we're out of time, because I feel we're a largely dysfunctional society, I still feel that a lot of the mop-up has to still occur in now institutional spaces. So, yeah, that's and, like, true. For example, where I work, I'm still intrigued, because uh, the guy who heads this place, he, sometimes he allows a certain kind of, um, do you say, reaction. And even I'm stunned by the amount of um, vociferousness he takes. He, you know, people can talk back to him anyhow, and he'll, he'll take it. And I'm like, wow, you know, I'm impressed. But maybe I'm just not used to that. And I think we need to encourage that kind of thing. And I like that kind of leadership, even though some will say he, he allows it too much. But I'd rather too much than too little. So we, we have a lot of work to do. And I'm just saying, where we miss it in the home, Let's be ready for it in the classroom. Let's be ready for it in the workplaces. Let's not continue the system the way it is. Pay rise for you, pay rise for you. <laughs> <laughs> five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually worked. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. What, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's it, really it, 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 I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. They say abuse is inevitable when purpose is unknown or words to that effect. So my advocacy this week is what is a government good for? What is our government good for? And I've often asked myself this question, sometimes several times in a day as I contemplate life and living in this country. What really is our government good for? Not security, suffering there, economy, jobs, welfare, health. 
The average person living in a city like Lagos or Enugu or Kaduna or anywhere routinely has to make provisions for water they drink, borehole, you must have a generator for power, no matter how small or how big, you have to contribute to your neighborhood watch, build high walls, and invest in study burglary bars, and, and even you know, invest in four-wheel drive vehicles just because of the condition of the roads and so on and so forth. So we're, we're all living like mini independent states, and indeed under siege by our own almighty state and federal government. I mean, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has exposed the failures of governments, and indeed, to some extent, the strengths of some other governments across the world. Some countries we used to admire and look up to clearly have failed their people. And I'm not talking about Nigeria here. But understanding globally has, has been reduced, um, and at least in our eyes. So here, here is my thing, though. Um, if you look at the countries over the last, say, six months who have demonstrated capacity in dealing with this particular pandemic, you see something, there's a, there's a tread. And you see that the countries who are doing well are countries who um, have this almost liberal, more democratic um, um, leaning. And to some extent, you find that they're all governed by women. I don't know if it's something that we need to talk about more. Um, from New Zealand, Germany, it's just, it's been, it's been women who are powering these countries. Um, and Taiwan, for example, Canada, well, he's not a woman, but he's doing a good job as well there. Um, but there's a thing, there's a thread that connects all of them. Um, so for us here in Nigeria, our story has been more like a chronicle of a, of a tragedy foretold. I remember very early on, we saw, we heard news reels of ministers going to the airports before the pandemic saying, oh, we've got it, everything covered, um, we're ready for it, um, no one should panic. But here we are, months later, and when the wind or the gale of corona blew, we were all exposed. Exposed was our incompetence and unseriousness. Clearly, we're out of our depth. And as I say, when, and let me borrow Liberos here, when it says, when the wind blows, we'll see foul nyash, something like that. We're, we're dealing with this corona crisis. But if you look at it, the health system that we have, which was suffering pre previously, right now, everybody is geared towards providing for the pandemic. But no one, when, you're not hearing dis discussions around um, how do we put in place a more robust health care system for the country? But, so everything is about providing test kits, PPE, isolation centers, and treatment centers. But there's an eerie siren, silence around how to implement a holistic health care system that can provide care beyond the pandemic. In fact, even more worrying is that daily tragic stories of patients dying from lack of care, not from COVID-19, but from other treatable ailments. Hospitals are rejecting patients. It appears that while everyone is focused on COVID-19, more people are dying daily from the crass incompetence of our government's inability to think beyond this COVID industry. So it is perhaps to say that when corona goes away, the enthusiasm for funding healthcare and indeed education will probably die. I don't know, if, but that's the reality we're seeing since there's no plan for it. So back to my question, what is our government good for? Or perhaps maybe I should end it this way. What should, the, the question should be, how do we make our government do good for us? And that is really my, my, my challenge to us today. Mm. Uh, I may not be able to answer that question, but let me at least talk about the, the aspect you raised about the women. Um, I think, you know, when you find government, because there's a saying, and I think it's um, Abraham Lincoln that said it, the government for the people, by the people, of the people. Um, if government is representative of the people, then you're less likely to have this kind of abuse. Yeah. Um, so when you have people in, I, I know women are not the minority normally in terms of numbers, but they are the minority in terms of representation. So when you have a woman show up at the table, she has known what it feels like to be neglected, to be the underdog. So she's less likely, that's my impression, to mm -hmm. abuse it. So she's more likely to be thinking, okay, putting herself in the shoe of the people she's serving. She's more because she knows yeah. how it is to be ignored. And so you, you should have, like even part of why I enjoy the advocate is the variety. So even if one person wants to have an agenda, because you have different people from different backgrounds, there's a check. But when you have government you know, being held down by one type of people, you know, if you have maybe in the UK where they have people coming from Eton or wherever they come from, Oxford, then you don't have a representative government. You know, if you have the male population, they get very comfortable in that there space. 
and they're not actually looking to be creative. So I really think the only reason these people have thrived now is that they're looking to be creative. They may not have all the answers, yeah. but they're actually looking for it. They're looking for ways to serve the people. So the will is there. You know, so, but when the will is not there, yes, you, what we're left with now is to do the hard work of chasing them, flogging them, but they don't actually want to serve us. You know, so you're going to have to police them all the way. Whereas if you've got people who are intentional about serving us, they'll be looking for ways now. They'll be overshooting your expectations. And that's where I want to leave it. So how do we make our government good for us? To establish that, I think we we'll first need to understand why our government exists mm -hmm. the way that it does, and then from there work our way to how to change that. So currently, as I was saying before, the Nigerian government, uh, ordinarily, a government is supposed to focus on a few major things, uh, provision of uh, a legal framework, uh, a justice system, law enforcement, foreign policy, uh, just those basic things, maybe healthcare and education, subsidize those things to an extent. And then everything else is left to the people to sort themselves out. The economy is left to the people. In Nigeria and in much of Africa, the government is an economic entity. The government dominates the economy. So the focus of government is not on providing services, it's not on providing value to people. The focus on government is on putting out contracts. It's, it's, on, it's, it's on enriching the people who are in government or people who are linked to, to government. the government, which goes back to the original, the advocacy that I, I put up today about us versus them. The structure of the post-colonial post African states is still based on the liberation movement, the anti-colonial liberation movement. So then there was, a, there was an enemy. So after kicking out the colonialists, then it became how do we protect ourselves from their exploitative capitalist system. So we do this thing called statism, where the state enwraps everything. So you know, instead of opening up the economy to the people, the state is this big brother that is holding everything. And unfortunately- No, but apparently what, what we have yeah. now is mirrored on the American system. <laughs> so they said, I, yeah, in, so reality, that's, that's, in reality, in reality yeah. we're a very state dominated yeah. entity, not just in Nigeria, but across the continent. Now, 50, is 60 years Is that not the function later, of the mindset of people there, not really the structure itself? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, but it was, so again, something I have to mention is that the post-colonial African state was also configured based on the Soviet states, not just the American yeah, state, as you think. For, for me, really, um, like, you know, when you were going through advocacy, what just came to mind was that, that song, what it is good for, absolutely nothing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, and then you ask yourself, what's the Nigerian government good for? Absolutely nothing. And then the only answer to it is what um, Aisha had said. Yeah. The way we go to churches and mosques, if all of us, you know, we have cleared the road for Jaga Jaga, let us now be the Jaga Jaga. It's the way we go to Redeem Camp, let all of us gather and stay on the express and say, today we will not leave until A, B, C. So for me, I think that, um, uh, you know, just a synthesis of all of this is uh, the way I see this, the reason why I put this together was to look at, put this advocacy together was to look at it from the point of view of that citizens themselves have to make a demand. And just to echo what Liberos yeah. said, we need to make that demand and say this is what we expect. It's not just about voting, because voting is something you do once in four years. Yes. But it, you know, the, the daily, the, the regular grind, making that demand of government to say, we want this, this is our right. Not just every four years you vote. So I think that, 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 that is something that we need to, uh, we need to focus on. So, well, um, I hope you've enjoyed uh, this week's episode. It's a wrap from, for, for us um, here today. We'll be returning next week, guys. Um, same time with much more to download. In the meantime, keep the conversation going on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag Advocate NG on Twitter, and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag Advocate NG. And to catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. You've been watching The Advocate on Plus TV Africa on DSTV channel 408. Um, go out there and keep advocating for a better society. Um, so it's bye from all, all of us in the studio. Bye bye. Peace. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed. It's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country 
when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.